Welcome to the University of Richmond. I'm so pleased to launch China Fest once again in person. Yay! When I was a new dean at the University of Richmond, and I'm so embarrassed to say how many years ago that was, um, I'm Martha Merritt, the Dean of International Education here, and I kept hearing the name Rose Chen. Rose Chen. Who is Rose Chen? Is she a member of our community? Yes, but. Does she live in Richmond? No, but. <laughs> when am I going to meet her? And the answer to that was China Fest. Roses and the Rose Group's effort to build bridges between the United States and China. You probably know that this weekend at the VMFA will be the blossoming of China Fest into a full community activity, but you're special because you're at the launch. Mm -hmm. And for the launch, we start with a speaker who is giving the Irby B. Brown lecture, and it's my privilege to have met Professor Irby Brown and to understand the legacy of this scholarship in his honor. We bring interesting speakers whom Rose identifies. They share their knowledge with you, and then you have the opportunity to see films, go to the VMFA during Family Day, which has become their largest event of the year. That is wow. It's really something that Rose has built. So it's my privilege to be part of it and to celebrate with you the relaunch of China Fest in person and to know what a very special speaker we'll hear from tonight. But it's our honored partner, Rose Chen, who will introduce our speaker. And may I simply say that in all the years, this is one of my favorite activities because of the life and the bridge building that Rose brings to our community here in Richmond. Please join me in welcoming her. Thank you so much, Masa, for the very, very warm and kind introduction. Uh, I get emotional here. You know, we started the China Fest 18 years ago, and it's not just one single person, it's a, a community of friends, and my committee member, my sponsors, and my partners, Osher, Peggy, Masa here, and a lot of volunteers. And uh, this is my family. I live in Richmond 26 years. I'm a spider. <laughs> but welcome back. Welcome back. We do this for you. And as I say earlier, uh, cross-cultural is not just between countries, US and China is important, but also between regions. I have friends from New York, presenter, they come here. Wow, they never realized Richmond can be so hospitable, right? And um, I just want to say we have a book show here and it has all the program and film, please take one. And it's my great pleasure to have uh, Hendo Lee as our speaker. When Hendo Lee say yes, I was floored. He's a busy person, as you can see. Um, I first heard of uh, Hendo Lee is a, through uh, New York Times, an article, talk about a cultural guru what he has done in China, introducing fine arts, uh, Western way of gallery, cuisine, and you know, uh, architecture, and Harley Davidson. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know that he's a lawyer, and I didn't know that lawyer can be so much fun. <laughs> On the series side, he's a uh, uh, senior partners and also international committee member at one of the largest uh, firm, uh, King and Wood Kellenson. Kellenson? Close enough. Close enough. Okay, thank you. And he also graduated from UVA and Georgetown, so he's a local hero, right? Uh, 
um, among his uh, many achievements is just the, the bun on the three on the bun in Shanghai, the American um, legation uh, quarter, and also he has won um, the highest uh, uh, medal from the French government and the Italian government. And he's also, the lately he's been uh, appointed as the co-chair of uh, the Asian Pacific American Center, which would be a museum at the National Mall down the road. And for tonight, he chooses this very uh, provocative uh, mm -hmm. title. And it's really, really appropriate. As you can learn from his story, his family, his uh, grandfather, his uh, father, himself, every member of his family, they are the first-hand witness to what's happening in China at a very critical moment. So now we had the man, Handel Lee, represented to you. Handel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I am really delighted to be here in Richmond. It's been a long time since I've been here, about 20 years. And uh, <clears throat> I'm glad to be here. Richmond is really such a lovely city, steeped in history, culture, beautiful architecture, landscape, and thick in the arts, literature, and urbaneness. Uh, I've always had <clears throat> an attachment to Richmond, although I was born in Washington, D.C., grew up across the Potomac in Maryland. Uh, but I am, as Rose mentioned, an alumni of a, a UVA, and many of my relatives call Virginia home, including my uncle, who was the Judge Advocate General of the United States. Uh, growing up uh, in Maryland, my grandfather talked much, actually, about the elegance of, of Southern culture. And he actually even said that the Confucian gentleman and the ideal of a, of a Confucian gentleman was indeed similar to that of the Virginia gentleman. When I was young, I even thought that maybe perhaps our family was related to Robert E. Lee. <laughs> <laughs> but sadly, 23 and me said, no DNA. <laughs> anyway, uh, when Rose asked me to, uh, to speak at the, this China Fest, I was, I was, um, I was, I was, I was honored. And but then, when you started talking about the past speakers, I, w I was a bit intimidated because all the speakers are are internationally recognized experts in their their field of study and and, and all China experts. I told Ro Rose that uh, you know I've done a lot of things in China, but maybe uh, my only true expertise is is uh, the practice of law. And could I talk about that? <laughs> and Rose flatly said, No. <laughs> Not interesting. <laughs> and, uh, and she said, well, well, why don't you just talk about your experience uh, and your observations of 27 years in China, and especially given your background, your family background, that might be interesting to the audience. And I said, well, I'm not sure, but uh, I'll give it a go. And so <clears throat> here we go. Um, I moved to Beijing as a lawyer from New York in 1991 uh, to open the office of a firm called Skadden Arps, uh, which is a major US law firm. And my commitment to the firm was to, uh, for three years, to live and work in, in, in Beijing. But those three years, somehow and very quickly, turned into almost 30. I mainly represented US multinational companies and investment banks entering into China at, a, at, at that early time. Uh, expanding their businesses and markets in China. But I also had the very unique experience of representing Chinese companies at that very early time uh, of their existence. Um, and together with pioneering investment banks, uh, we, we did groundbreaking work of corporatization of China's industries. For instance, we, we did the IPO of Sinopec. Uh, Sinopec was the petro petrochemical bureau of the Ministry of Energy. And, and 
and in 1983, it got spun out the operations to set up Sinopec. But within within less than 10 years, we we're talking about working with Morgan Stanley, talking about how to privatize it to a certain extent and do a listing in, in on the New York Stock Exchange. And 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 but through this very interesting experience. Um, of, of, of not only working in the early days in China and, and doing these projects, I've, I've seen firsthand the mutual admiration and respect by and between Americans and Chinese, between the U.S. companies and their Chinese counterparts, and indeed their, their governments. And we saw the relationship during that time when I was there hit new highs, hit new lows, and and uh, so the years I was there between 1991 and 2018 uh, were, were very critical years. But what was interesting was in every one of those years, China imported more goods from America than from any other country. And it still does to this day. And China has been America's biggest trading partner, surpassing Canada in 2015, and still is America's largest trading partner today. And of interesting significance and special significance, U.S. invested companies in China last year, in 2021, sold more than $450 billion worth of products inside China. And, and so this is a very full uh, um, relationship. Uh, and, but, and, and up until 2018, when things changed, American and Chinese researchers, scientists, and engineers cooperated in more fields uh, than between any two other countries in the world, in areas such as fighting cancer, splitting genes, developing green technologies, investigating atomic particles, developing hydrogen energy, advancing AI, the Internet of Things, and their applications. But as I mentioned during that time, the relationship between Washington and Beijing swung wildly from mutual admiration and engagement, cooperation, to suspicion, anger, and accusations. And now, across the board, unfortunately, we see this non-virtuous cycle of paranoia and decoupling. In China, anti-American bigots and nationalists fan this paranoia, accuse America as, as strong-arming other nations to threaten and contain China and to stop its economic devel development. This narrative is now infecting every level of China's government, the party, and even the general population. In America, there's no shortage of populists and politicians who blame China for the world's ills and America's decline and spread the specter of China paranoia and national as being a national risk. And this has also infected almost every level of American politics and society. And now this mutual paranoia, I believe, is spiraling down faster, accelerated by even more mutual misunderstanding, misreading, and misinterpretation. Almost every field in which the United States and China used to cooperate in, but especially in economics and science, and science uh, the relationship is now not just science and economics, but it's national security. They used to run on very parallel tracks. Now those, par those tracks have merged, and, 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 th and that's, a, that's a huge concern. We, I, I think we've entered a new phase of U.S.-China relations, or perhaps a repeat of history, where, the, where paranoia of red China has devolved into an, into an ideological and perhaps existential challenge. American democracy versus Chinese authoritarianism. <clears throat> and I'm terribly troubled by the nadir that we have reached. But I have also been intrigued by these swings and cycles of the relationship between Americans and Chinese and, their, and our governments throughout the 300 year history that, that the two countries and the two people have interacted. Particularly interesting to me is the impact of early American businessmen and merchants and 
American missionaries in China because that is related to my family and, and my professional background. Many people believe that America's ties to China began when Nixon went to China in 1972, ending the Cold War between the two countries. But in fact, the two sides have been interacting and influencing each other significantly since before the founding of the United States. America's first forays into the lucrative China trade started in the colonial days. And by the mid-1800s, the huge profits that merchants made from that trade did much to finance America's industrial revolution. Just after 1776, American traders needed new markets beyond the sway of Great Britain and Europe. And in China at that time was a manufacturing powerhouse responsible for almost one third of all the goods produced in the world. And China caught the imagination of intrepid American businessmen and traders. Robert Morris, uh, a signer of the Declaration of Independence and who bankrolled the American Revolution, was approached by one of these intrepid young merchants named John Ledyard and proposed, quote unquote, the greatest commercial enterprise that has ever been embarked upon by this country. Morris bought into it, and he became the angel investor, if you will, in the dream of this great commercial enterprise with China. And, it, and he financed the first dedicated sailing ship for China trade called the Empress of China. And eventually, more than 200 American sailing ships dedicated to trade for China with China followed, loaded with furs, spirits, silver, and ginseng from Appalachia, and other goods. They returned with tea, cloths, silks, and a lot of porcelain. In fact, including George Washington's 320-piece uh, china set used by Martha to entertain at Mount, Ver at Mount Vernon. Within decades, America became the Qing Dynasty's uh, number two trading partner after the mighty British. Uh, and, who, and the British mostly trafficked opium, and the Americans trafficked, trafficked actually products that, that China wanted. Um, and, and the British demanded payment in silver. And, China, and, and the Americans, traders, actually paid with silver. And, and paid with Mexican silver dollars mostly, which played a crucial role in reversing the outflow of silver to the British. But soon, American traders started selling Turkish opium into China. And by the 1830s, 1840s, British American ships were bringing in over 350 to 400 tons of opium per year into China, which reversed uh, America's trade imbalance um, and also reversing the payments and flow of silver. Trade with China became so significant and profitable that a compelling reason proffered for building the Transcontinental Railroad was that it would allow the United States and its merchant business people to become the interlocutor and the conduit for trade between Europe and China. Sea freight from China to California, then via the Transcontinental Railroad to the East Coast and from there shipped to Europe was a straight shot faster and cheaper than the more securitous overland and, and, and sea routes between Europe and China. At that time, uh, the Qing government, however, also looked for benefit from America, and not just in trade, but actually as a bulwark against its enemies uh, to counter the British, the Germans, the French, the Japanese, and Russians, and actually later the Soviets, who all took colonial, colonial territories and commercial concessions inside of China. And indeed, with the dawn of America as a global power at the turn of the, at the, turn of the 20th century, Washington advocated policies to keep China as a country whole, despite efforts of European nations to carve it into colonies. And in fact, in, in 1908, Theodore Roosevelt, President Roosevelt, to assist China, established the Boxer Indemnity Scholarships to bring its scholars to American colleges and 
and that spawned Nobel Prize winners, scientists, engineers, writers, and educators that really changed and sparked a intellectual renaissance in China in the in the in the nineteen twenties and thirties. This included my paternal grandfather. He was a boxer scholar who obtained his master's and doctorate uh, degrees in theology at U.S. colleges and became a longtime president of China's largest Protestant seminary uh, in, in, in China and worked very closely with American missionaries. American missionaries arrived in China in the 1830s with the dedication and dreams of converting millions of Chinese to Christianity and turning China into the world's largest Christian nation. American missionaries sometimes are portray, pro, pro, portrayed unfairly as an example of American cultural imperialism. But in truth, however, American missionaries were crucial to China's development, bringing the tools and the knowledge to break the stranglehold of, America, of China's traditional orthodoxy. They taught the Chinese Western science, Western school curriculum, critical thinking, industry, law, and even basketball. <laughs> American missionaries, often multi-generational families, did their most impactive work in the poorest areas of rural China, again, sometimes saying generations, but also in the big cities. By the 1920s, they had established, American missionaries established thousands of elementary schools throughout China, hundreds of middle schools, and, and, and dozens of medical missions, seminaries, and universities all throughout China. By 1930s, there were more than 10,000 American Protestant missionaries working in China. The ties between American Christians and China did not exist between, between the United States and American, American missionaries and any other country. Many of these educational institutions founded and set up by American, mission, by American missionaries still exist today, although some are renamed, and rank among China's elite institutions, and some even in the world. St. John, I'll give you an example of a few. St. John's in Shanghai, which broke up into uh, East China, Huadong, and Jiaotong uh, universities. Tsinghua University, uh, uh, whose architecture and its grand auditorium is modeled after the rotunda, UVA's rotunda. It looks exact, almost exactly like it. It was ranked number one in the world by U.S. News and World Reports as the number one engineering school. Nanking Theological Seminary, it's where my grandfather, the Reverend Hank Lee, was the president for 20 years. And the Union Medical College and Hospital, where my mother was born. The Yanjing University, Yanjing University, whose campus and several departments were dissolved and transferred over to today's Peking University. I'd like, to, I'd like to mention that the Yanjing University, again, dissolved into what is now the prestigious Beijing University, was founded by a fourth generation Presbyterian missionary named John Layton Stewart of the distinguished Stewart family of Virginia, whose uncle was General Jeb Stewart. My maternal grandfather, Philip Fu, was a faithful colleague of Leighton Stewart. They worked closely together for almost 50 years, first to develop the university, and later during the war, and when Stewart was US ambassador to China, trying to mediate a peace between the KMT and the communists. And with that in interaction of American missionaries, of American merchants, and, and the US government, American ideas and ideals and culture came into and, and inspired Chinese, especially the young intellectuals, pulling them closer to modernity and to a greater outside world. And also American products 
came into China, especially later. The products, movies, science, investment, technology, all flowed into China. And Chinese art, food, students, engineers, scientists, and the Made in China products flowed out. Since then, layer by layer, the two peoples and their various governments created the deepest, most multifaceted, most profitable relationship between any two nations in the world. And this relationship was essential in China's developing into the second largest economy in the world. Yet the Chinese Communist Party, when, when politically expedient, would whitewash America's contributions to China. Chinese politicians, like their American counterparts, would manipulate nationalism for opportunistic and political ends. The current narrative, well, a, a significant narrative coming from the PRC state media, is that Washington now is fabricating a false narrative that the PRC wants to rewrite and replace the existing international order and displace the United States as its dominant power. And the US is acting like a schoolyard bully looking for a fight with China, where the schoolyard is actually the world today. However, I believe in China, most Chinese are pri privately acknowledge and are grateful to America and Americans for their historical relationship, their current friendships, and their role in China's ascent. American values of freedom and fairness, American education, and even American fresh air became the standard hoped for by most Chinese privately and sometimes publicly. And every CCP leader, starting from Li Shou, uh, uh, Liu Shaoqi, Deng, Deng Xiaoping, have sent their children to study in American universities, including the current leader, Xi Jinping's Harvard-trained Harvard daughter. When I was in China, American, cultures, American culture started dominating China's TV screens and movie theaters. The NBA boasted more fans and TV viewers in any market in China than in any market um, except for the United States. And Christianity experienced a renaissance of unprecedented proportions, despite the efforts of the CCP to control it. The Pew, Re the Pew Research estimated in 2010 that there were 68 million Christians in China, with potentially another 40 to 60 million that, that, that worshiped in underground churches, which means these churches were not officially registered with the government. And several American Christian organizations have estimated that there are well over 100 million practicing Christians today. And by, by 2030, China will, in fact, become the largest Christian nation in the world in numbers, with over 200 million practicing Christians. Incredibly fulfilling the dreams of the early American missionaries. I found that astounding. The strongest impression and takeaway from my years in China is that in spite of the cycles of love and hate in China relations, in US-China relations, American and Americans are deeply respected and admired, if not subject to a conflicted envy in China by most Chinese, including its leaders. And, and I'll, I'll give you a few examples to illustrate this. In 1999, Washington and Beijing were engaged in very difficult, drawn out, drama filled negotiations for China to join the WTO. China was straining and wincing under the tough negotiation and the, you know, the tough negotiations and bruising demands for its entry. The, state, the Chinese state media was broadcasting much anti-U.S. government reports on, on unfairness and the bullying that it was receiving. At this time, also, the Kosovo war was going on, uh, being waged by NATO. But on May 7th, US, the U.S. military launched five guided missiles that hit the PRC embassy in Belgrade, destroying the embassy and killing three journalists there. Anger 
uh, and protests erupted in Beijing and, and, and many cities. Students surrounded the U.S. Embassy in Beijing and the, the uh, ambassador's residence for almost a week. The official account given by the United States was that the bombing was an accident caused by the CIA using old maps and giving wrong coordinates. <laughs> President Clinton at first expressed, expressed regret for the bombing. China wanted an apology. Almost no one, almost no one in China believed that the U.S. used the wrong maps and that indeed the bombing was intentional. So two days after the bombing, I, I hosted a dinner at one of my restaurants uh, in Beijing with, with a vice minister of uh, commerce, a friend of mine who was actually the director general of the Department of Laws and Treaties under the Minister Ministry of Commerce, and they were all involved in WTO, WTO negotiations, and, and, a, and a friend who was a, was, a, was a consultant with McKinsey. Well, at dinner, there was a loud debate over, over the bombing. The vice minister uh, it, you know, said, of course the United States did it on purpose. And they did it to send a strong message to us. And, and they sent that, they did it because they could do it with impunity because we are too weak. And you know what? They're right. We are too weak. We are too weak. Do you think the United States would have bombed the Russian embassy? Uh, my, uh, the, the McKenzie consultant who went to Harvard and MIT Sloan School and most, client, uh, most of her, her clients were American companies, she felt that the, the U.S. certainly had to have done it intentionally because the U.S. military was just too good, too intelligent, and too sophisticated to make that type of mistake and to rely on CIA maps. Uh, and and uh, the CIA was incapable of making that type of rookie mistake. Um, she said, this is the U.S. military. <laughs> Uh, my friend, uh, the de director general of the Department of Laws and Treaty, who was also a Georgetown law grad, was one of the few people who said, the United States certainly did it by accident. It was, it was beyond, it was not beyond belief that the CIA used wrong maps. And he was adamant that the United States would not purposefully bomb the PRC embassy. And that's why President Clinton is not apologizing, but only expressing regret. And plus, he said, those three people were reporters that were killed. Why was the embassy shielding reporters in the embassy? That's not right. Those reporters were probably sending out dispatches from that embassy. The US honed in on those uh, signals and bombed where those signals are emanating from. And he said, if that was the case, we deserved it. And with that comment, the argument dinner ended. <laughs> the vice minister stood up, pointed to my friend, and said, you and your big mouth is getting yourself in trouble again. Tomorrow morning, first in the office, see me. And he stormed out. Awkward. <laughs> um, we sat there, chatted for a while. Uh, the, my other friend, who was the consultant, left, and my my friend, he was he was very distraught. And, and as I as I walked him out to his car, he he kind of turned to me in a low voice and said, "I if I can't believe in the United States, what country can I believe in?" Give you another example of the interesting depth of feeling that people have for China, uh, for America. Bo Xilai, Bo Xilai incident. Bo Xilai was a charismatic, powerful politician in China, which was a contemporary of Xi Jinping. They actually grew up in the same compound. His, his father, Bo Xilai's father, like Xi Jinping's father, was one of the founding fathers of the PRC and was an economic reformer. 
but who was later purged by Mao in the 1960s. Bo, Bo rose quickly and became go a governor of a province, the Minister of Commerce, and later became party secretary of a, a huge, important uh, municipality called Chongqing. And he led, he was the head of a, of a strong political faction and forged then alliances with China's security, the head of China's security faction and military sectors. Bo was handsome, casual, charismatic, and interestingly, he was, he was very pro-American. I mean, he was, when he was Minister of Commerce, he would personally go to America, just to go to America, and to negotiate trade deals, reduction of tariffs, IP prote protections. I think he personally negotiated four deals, and he, he just had to go by himself. Well, personally to go, because he, he just wanted to be in America. He, he loved the comparisons, and sometimes it was him comparing himself, to being statesmanlike, as, as statesmanlike as Kissinger, as environmentally conscious uh, as Al Gore, and as young and dashing as Kennedy. He liked being referred to as China's Kennedy. He was amb but he was extremely ambitious and a political opportunist. And he became a threat to Xi Jinping's position as becoming the CCP's chairman just before she was installed in 2012. Bo had orchestrated before that a very strong populist movement based upon the pining for the glory days of Mao of the 1950s and 60s, very leftist. He became so popular that he said he was public, he was publicly loved almost as Princess Diana. <laughs> he became even more popular with his version of clean, draining the swamp of corruption that really at that time in China got very bad. And he was notoriously brutal in his, in his campaign to drain the, drain the swamp and clean it up. He was a, he, he a self-styled Elliot Ness. I think he referred himself to, that, to Elliot Ness also. And again, brutally, he was brutal in, in the way he took out not only corrupt officials, but political enemies. And he was, he was and, and, and he, he was very adept at raising and more support and rousing their political base by using virulent anti-American fake news propaganda. Even though he would point, he would proudly point out to visitors the U.S. the, the American MBA certificate he hung on his on, on his office wall that he that he earned online. <laughs> Wong, but Wong, he ran crosswise with Bo's even more powerful wife, who murdered her British business partner, which Wong helped to cover up. Fearing for his life, it all kind of came apart. Wong fled to the American consulate hundreds of miles away in Chengdu on a midnight run in the middle of the night, literally knocked on the gates asking for protection and asylum. It's so ironic, it's hypocritical, but so insightful that even this anti-US demagogue sought security and fair treatment from the United States. And both cases of Bo and Wong show the feelings that they had for America. Um, I'll give you another example. In, in 2015, with Obama's pivot to Asia, Washington was rewriting the rules of trade in Asia with a vast trade agreement called the TPP, and it was specifically designed to contain China's rise in global trade in the Pacific region and to power shift trade dominance back to the, to the United States. The U.S. Led negotiations, led negotiations with over 20 countries that bordered the Pacific. 
except China was excluded from those negotiations. And when the TPP was completed, 12 Pacific Rim nations initially joined, including Japan, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Mexico, Vietnam, Singapore, and several others. The TPP not only countered China on trade in its own backyard, it went beyond trade to stipulate how member countries' internal government structures must be developed or maintained, including localized restrictions on domestic content, elimination of subsidies, monopolies, adoption of market reforms, and environmental standards, and the elimination of US tariffs, among others. The Beijing was howling and livid over the TPP. Again, official news media and broadcasts went again anti-American, accusing Washington of bullying. At this time, however, I arranged a meeting with China's Minister of Commerce with my US client, and we were trying to get a tariff exemption for their polysilicon exports into China. During this meeting, with the minister, the discussion turned to the TPP, which I expected to turn ugly and very concerned that this would really sink our chances of getting that exemption. Uh, but I was surprised and relieved that the minister calmly said that actually China hopes someday to apply to join the TPP if and when China could meet the membership requirements. He said that, in fact, the reforms of the China's state industrial policy that was going on and, uh, and, and of the SOEs and commercial in industries mostly aligned with the tough requirements and tough and liberal requirements of the TPP. And he interestingly noted that the looming American-led TPP would help speed the implementation of these critical reforms. So these are just a few examples that belie a very complex, conflicted, but deep-seated admiration and, and respect that, that the Chinese, even the Chinese government and its leaders have for America from the senior leaders you know, down to farmers. But two things happened, I think, that initiated this current change in the direction and dynamic of US-China relations uh, and, and to cause them to move downwards to where we are today. These two things, I think, number one is the 2008 global financial crisis, and second is China's obsession with the middle income trap. Global financial crisis, 2008, started with predatory lending here in the United States. International webs of US created mortgage-backed securities, which led to the collapse of Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers that started an international economic contagion. It wreaked havoc across, it, it wreaked cross-border economic uh, damage and threatened global financial stability. But unlike the COVID pandemic, Washington and Beijing worked hand in hand, no finger pointing, to, and they stopped and mitigated, mitigated the worst effects of the crisis and restored international macroeconomic stability. For example, the US Treasury obtained an agreement from China's Ministry of Finance, a huge holder of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac securities, along with other US financial bonds and corporate bonds. But it was convinced not to sell their holdings of US securities, which was critical to avoiding another Great Depression. Also, another example, the China Investment Corporation transferred billions of dollars, over, over $5 billion, in capital infusions into Morgan Stanley to plug its liquidity gap. Nevertheless, the, the great financial crisis did cause a crisis in China, a crisis in confidence in America. The GFC sent shockwaves to China, not only for what it did to the world economy, but how could the smartest people in the room, i.e. the investment bankers, 
the lawyers, uh, and the financial regulators. Okay, we can take the lawyers out. Uh, how could they allow this to happen? And this caused a lot of introspection within China, especially at the within decision makers and then. And because China was really looked up to and relied upon the advice of these investment bankers. And actually, the, the Ministry of Finance, the US, the U.S. Treasury, had incredible, incredible dialogue and sessions, working sessions. But, but it, it was just almost un uncomprehensible. How could they let this happen? Or how could it happen? But again, no public finger reporting, but it was like, but within China, their credibility and Americans' credibility over its wisdom and competence was severely shaken. So that changed things a bit, shifted things. The second, the middle income, income trap. Does anybody know what the middle income trap is? Well, in China, I can tell you, almost everybody knows. Over the past 40 years, 40 years, over 700 million people in China have been lifted out of poverty through China's reform, open door policy, and obviously a lot of the interactions that China has had with the United States and other countries. But this, this incredible feat was driven by an obsession to grow China's GDP, to reach middle income status, and then someday to achieve the quote-unquote China dream, which is a slogan adopted by Xi Jinping in 2012, which includes becoming a quote-unquote moderately prosperous society. Maybe hitting the lower bands of a high-income society. The middle income trap defined by the, and presented by the World Bank in 2006, is a situation where a developing country rapidly grows out of poverty, only to get stuck in the middle income range, with a per capita GDP between $1,000 and $13,600 today. The year I arrived in China in 1991, per capita GDP in China was $330, 1991. By 2000, by the year 2000, per capita GDP in China increased threefold to almost just shy of a thousand at the cusp of the middle income range. And from 2000 to 2018, the year I left China, GDP per capita increased 10 times to just shy of $10,000. And today, China's GDP is hovering in $12,000, $12,500, not sure what it is because of obviously the impact of zero COVID shutdown. It, it may actually dip down. But just for a comparison, today the US per capita GDP is about $70,000. That's the difference. $12,000 versus $70,000. The, the middle income track the trap. To increase China's per capita GDP keeps Chinese leaders up at night and haunts them. That's what they think about at night. That's what I can guarantee you what the first thing they think about in the morning. Not Taiwan, not South China Sea, not semiconductors. Although they're kind of related because they need that, well, semiconductors to move up. But they really, their main focus is domestic. How do we go from 12,000 per capita GDP, maybe to 20, maybe to be a third of what the United States is? That's, that is their preoccupation. China is not looking at world dominance. That's not what they want. They want their per capita income to rise. In, the th in, the, in, in, in his work report in, in 2016 to the 19th Party Congress, Prime Minister Li Keqiang, who's currently still Prime Minister until next month, talked about in length the necessary economic and policies reforms that China must implement. And in the end of the report, 
He stated, during the next five years, we must resolutely and earnestly work and take care, and take particular care to avoid falling into the middle income trap. The then Minister of Finance of China, Lo Jiwei, put the odds publicly, the odds of China becoming ensnared in the trap at 50%. Because between 1960 and 2009, only 15 of the 101 middle income economies escaped the middle income trap. The overwhelming majority of middle income countries are still there. With only a handful, like Hong Kong, Japan, Singapore, South Korea, Taiwan, South Africa, which are potentially clearly out of the, the trap. But according to World Bank and American economists, to avoid the middle income trap requires new governmental policies to redirect resources away from cheap labor, cheap capital, to capital reinvestment to grow the middle class, drive domestic consumption, which will drive GDP growth, and spur innovation that can be applied back into its domestic economy. And that's exactly what China did. There was an urgency to change especially because China was facing an, an inevitable change in its demographic. China was getting old faster than it was getting rich. In 2009, China officially initiated the rebalancing of the economy, shifting resources and sources of economic growth away from manufacturing and export markets and inwards towards private consumption, domestic innovation, and being a leader and innovator in science and technology. And in 2015, it announced its Made in China Plan 2025. And I, I'm, I'm not sure if you've heard about that. But this is a state-led industrial policy aimed at rapidly developing China's high-tech sectors, advanced manufacturing base, and, specific, and specifically in new energy vehicles, next generation IT and telecommunication, advanced robotics, biotechnology, and artificial intelligence, and also artificial proteins. Uh, but the Made in China 2025 plan had been characterized and viciously attacked by former President Trump and his, and, and his administration as a threat to China, that is, as a threat to America. And this actually sparked, that was a reason given, uh, to restrict PRC investments, restriction on semi semiconductor sales, to go after, to ban PRC telecoms, not only, not only in, in the United States, but actually a lot of pressure around the world with this whole Huawei stuff. Uh, and actually, actually led to the CHIPS Act, which is actually China, America's version of made in China 2025 with a lot of government stimulus of, of, of high tech, innovation, AI, and investing companies uh, with government grants uh, to, to uh, I think it's what, $81 billion to do that. But during the same time, actually during the same time, while well, internationally the U.S. champion uh, champion globalization, which really effectively drove significant U.S. consumption because of lower prices and GDP growth, domestically, the United States was, was still kind of clinging to a growth model based upon borrowing to pay for current spending. And so the federal government, state governments were piling up huge debts. Expensive. Individuals became addicted to credit card debt and mortgage debt, not to mention so much social energy consumed by social and political polarization. I think this led to a dynamic change, a destabilizing change between the relationship of China and the United States. China was changing rapidly, and the US did not. China emerged as a leading driver of global economic growth. I think at one time, China was responsible for almost 50% of global increase in productivity and GDP. Not the, United, not the United States anymore. And while Washington was reinforcing its rule over the global 
economic and security status quo that we established after World War II. China was turned into, at least in their U.S. worldview, as an uncomfortable challenger to the existing international order. And especially where worrisome was, and still is, Xi Jinping's dramatic centralization of political and economic power organization and his grip on that power. Cooperation became to be seen as competition. Competition became conflict. Conflict became, com be be became confrontation, which led to a full-blown trade war, technology war, and the securitization of China and the United States relationship across the board. And in this paradigm, almost anything can be described or characterized as a national security issue. We talk about almost trade, investment. It's, you can't talk about this now, US-China, without talking about national security. Recently, a lot of talk about farmland and how we need to ban Chinese from buying U.S. farmland. The Chinese own 192,000 acres of farmland in America, 146,000 of which is owned by Shuanghui, the company that bought Smithfield um, back in 2013. But that 192 only represents 0.5% of the total foreign-owned farmland in America, which is a total of 35 million acres. So this is certainly purchasing farmlands near military bases, uh, to critical infrastructure, or to other any you know, sensitive areas. It is a, na a legitimate national security concern. But 50,000 acres and a huge pig farm, I don't know, you know how does that ra get raised to a national security level? So it's, it's the, 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 the broadness now of how almost anything can be described as national security. And, and, and you know what, that's still also in China. And, and that's the unfortunate situation in the relationship now. This paradigm shift has occurred, and it continues to spiral. The U.S. sees China as a stealer of American technology, pilferers of American jobs, stockpiler of American debt, and now a challenger to America for military supremacy in South China Seas and even perhaps around the world. China sees the U.S. as a paranoid, bullying unit power, unwilling to evolve international, the international economic and security order to account for the world's new reality. And it's trying to stop China at every step of its, of its development of the economy and industry. And, and in fact, it is that America is trying to push China back down further into that middle income trap. And this new paradigm further entangles the relationship. We now may be entering, and it's been much discussed, a new trap called the, the controversial concept of the Thucydides trap. The Thucydides trap is a scenario where a great power dominant, a great power's dominant position is challenged by a rising power. The resulting stress makes war the rule and not the exception. Political scientist Graham Allison coined the term and posited that it was the rise of Athens, you know, uh, and, and I guess recorded by Thucydides, and the fear of this, the rise that instilled in Sparta, in the dominant Sparta, a, a, a massive concern and fear, and that made war in, inevitable. Uh, Graham Allison led a Harvard study uh, that found 16 similar historical instances, and out of the 16, 12 ended up in war. 
this is constantly talked about in China. And, and she and his communications, actually both with Trump and with Biden, has mentioned, we got to avoid this. The rising power, that is China, appears to be on that collision course with a dominant power that is the United States, as predicted in Allison's 2017 book called Destined for War. And most alarming, we now hear our politicians already characterizing our conflict with China as being a Cold War, which is, a, which is an ideological existential war of Western democracy and Eastern or Chinese authoritarianism. But it didn't have to go this way. And hopefully there's a chance to avoid this, to avoid the worst case scenario, but perhaps even to repair and set straight, set straight a balanced and mutually dynamic growing relationship again. But obviously the big question is whether there is a political vision in both countries, the political will, and ultimately the political courage to resolve this conflict before it's too late. Today, the United States and China face each other, their historical friendships in tatters, decoupling their valuable collaborations over the decades and seemingly marching to a beat to the drumbeat of war. And while the world can only watch, and the grand issues of global warming, poverty alleviation, terrorism, nuclear weapons pro proliferation, and pandemic are not being addressed and cannot be. None of these issues, global issues, can be resolved unless Washington and Beijing find a way to work together. And actually, the holy grail of US-China relationship should simply be the maintenance of global peace, not only avoiding the Thucydides trap for themselves, but ensuring that regional conflicts will be re resolved without war. If the United States and China were properly engaged, surely the Ukraine war right now could have been averted or at the very least, disarmed. China and the United States arouse deeply conflicted feelings in one another and in its peoples. Yet no other two nations mutual cooperation is, a more, is more vital to the fate of our world. Seemingly, these two great nations are being very recalcitrant right now. But the, U the United States, I have to say, has no choice but to change tact and start its efforts to pull China, together with itself, back to the right track. No other country and no other people has more historical credibility and foresight than America and Americans to do so and to influence China. As the great historian and China expert Orville Schell observed, for better or for worse, we are all in a common enterprise with China from where there is no escape. We need to find wiser choices, grasp stable common ground, as we look to untangle a relationship that started almost three centuries ago. But throughout this history, there has been irresistible forces that bring and attract the two countries together and its two peoples closer. So let's pray for and keep the faith in both. Thank you. What a sweeping, masterful, and bold vision. Worth coming out on a snowy evening. And no law. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but it was rooted in law. Um, um, our speaker has kindly agreed to take some questions. I would ask you to keep your questions short and to the point, if it's possible. 
after such a magisterial address. Please. I'll try to keep my answers short and to the point. <laughs> Can you comment on the relationship between China and Taiwan and why there seems to be, um, well, I'll let you comment. What, what, what is the future there and what do you see the future there? And why is there that tension? It's hard to keep this one short. Uh, yeah. All right. We all know the history of why there's two separate Chinas. Because the Civil War, Chiang Kai-shek, KMT, fled to Taiwan. Mao was about to launch the invasion. Seventh Fleet came in and stopped it. So the war is unfinished. Both claim China as, as being the ruler of China. But it, it, it is significant unfinished business, and it gets very historically important and emotionally important, and it, 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 it relates to China's 150 years of humiliation and foreign intervention in, in China's affairs, and you've, you've, heard, you've heard all that. But I had, I'll, I'll say this. I don't believe that Xi Jinping, in spite of certain things that he has said, is looking at a military resolution for Taiwan anytime soon. And it certainly is not the first option. It's not even the second option. If, and I was just talking to someone about this, if you're looking for direction of how China is going about, and its timeline for Taiwan. If you look at internal party documents, it just came out with a uh, white paper on the history of China, which talks about Taiwan, the eventual historical reunification, but says time is on our side. Um, the work report from the 20th Party Congress talks about Taiwan, does not put in any timeline on it, which is key. Uh, but it, it, it also says the preferred is a peaceful, the preferred route is a peaceful reunification. A peaceful reunification only means non-military. It doesn't mean it's benign, but it's, it, it's, it has stated in many, many documents that peaceful reunification is the preference. And China, is not going to say we will just commit to peaceful reunification publicly. Just like the United States would never give up the, the right of first use of nuclear weapons, which it hasn't. Russia it hasn't. No country, nuclear armed country, except for China, and India has said no first use. And China said it doubled down on it several times. So, but, but, but the right to use military is certainly an option, but it's not their first option. So, you know, what's happening in Ukraine is not a precursor or a model or, or now uh, what happens in Ukraine it means China's next. In fact, Ukraine, what's happening in Ukraine probably makes China, you know, think twice or three times. I mean, it is, uh, Ukraine is surrounded by Russian and Rus Russian and Russian controlled territories. China and Taiwan is separated by 90 miles of ocean. And China, frankly, just does not have the military capabilities. China has the world's largest navy, the uh, world's largest missile force, but it does not have the capability to, to launch that type of military operation. It, it, it just doesn't. And, and, and I think it, it, it's been made painfully clear how difficult it would be, uh, it, it would be, especially with the, the Ukraine war as an example. So I, 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 I highly doubt, um, and I know there's a lot of talk. In fact, the Assistant Secretary of Defense said two years 
two years, China will military attack, mil militarily attack Taiwan. Well, as Ryan Haas said, well, we are uh, 10 and 0 of uh, predicting zero of China's next military attack on Taiwan. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so I, 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 China's been very bellicose because if there is just one red line that's going to cause a a a a, a, a serious confrontation between the United States and China, the red line is the United States supporting Taiwan independence movement. Right and changing dramatically the existing kind of this ambiguous status to make it more non-ambiguous the United States is wholly supporting Taiwan and its movement to independence. That would be dangerous. Okay. If that doesn't happen, this strategic ambiguity, in fact, it's a pretty good way of dealing with the Taiwan situation. Continuing to protect Taiwan, protect its trade, protect its form of government, uh, continuing with the with the uh, uh, sales of defense of defense equipment, but but the, you know the United States should try a a, a, a multi pronged approach to 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 encourage constructive ways of how to not only decrease the tension, not to raise the tension, decrease the tension and eventually look for a mutually agreed to path to some sort of reunification 50 years from now, 100 years from now. It's, don't, don't set any no. Goals, because once once any goals are set, if they came out and said, "Okay, twenty years, ten years," or if China came out and said, "Oh, time is running out," then then I think we have an issue. You um, in your speech, you indicated that the general population of China is generally uh, friendly. Mm -hmm friendly to the United States, right. and yet um, the authoritarian government, Communist Party, um, doesn't appear to be. And I just wonder, um, do you think over time, because whenever, it seems to me in history, whenever there's been a, a government that has such a grip on the people and they have no real voice in who their leaders are, that eventually, that government fails. Mm -hmm. Do you think, what, what do you think the staying power of um, the CCP is? Uh, I think the staying power of the CCP over the past uh, 40 years has been the ability to grow China economically, pull 700 million people out of poverty, and continue that. That is what keeps the CCP in power. You know, and honestly, that's why they're not going to do anything with Taiwan. If they do anything in Taiwan, that economic growth is shattered. China will be a it will be a uh, his economy is standing in the world. It will be a pariah. The Communist Party is in power because it has delivered on the promise of economic growth and making the life for the average Chinese better and the future is better. That's how it stays in power. And you know, in, in a certain way, and I don't want to go off the point because you told me to be short and concise with my answer. Great. We're covering a lot of ground. <laughs> so, so listen. I, I, I think uh, what Xi Jinping is doing in consolidating power is frightening because power corrupts. But what he did, why did he consolidate power when he took over in 2012? China was coming out of a very weak 10 years under Hu Jintao. Deng set up this concept of, uh, of collective leadership, so we don't have the excesses of uh, like Mao, right? 
collective leadership means we have many leaders and we talk and we come to a consensus. That was a marriage of convenience or that concept. Because China at that time, even Deng, did not have enough power to, to unify the many factions within the Communist Party. So collective leadership actually equals a coalition government. Okay. Under Deng and even Jiang Zemin, the center was a little stronger, so he could actually kind of manage this coalition. Hu Jintao, weak. So the, so the factions became so strong, stronger than Hu, Hu Jintao. <laughs> um, and I won't continue with that. Um, that, so that example, Bo Xilai, very powerful uh, uh, base, faction leader, did a deal with security, Zhou Yongkong, military, so powerful that he could have, uh, have overthrown Xi. But what happened was, so coalition, uh, the coalition government or collective leadership, I give you the military, I give you the oil and gas industry, I give you the security apparatus and offshore borders. And, and I won't, and, and they're silos. Even as party secretary, party you know, chairman, I won't get in your business, I won't get in your business, and I won't get in your business. You do what you want to do. That breeds massive corruption. Mm -hmm. Because there, there used to be at least some sort of check and balance within that coalition. But with a weak central leader, it just evolved into fiefdoms. And that's what, and that's, uh, that's uh, what happened. So Xi Jinping, when he came into power, I won't go into too much detail. He saw the only way to break the, what he called the vested interests in the party, unless he broke that, there's no way to govern China. And there would be, there's no future for the Chinese Communist Party, and China will fall into chaos. And in, in an amazing way, he broke those silos, he launched a, a, an aggressive, what he called the, the, the anti-corruption campaign, lasted seven years. First one after the military, second the security apparatus, third the big SOE oil companies, coal companies, which had all the money. Listen, I did, I did work related to Sinopec. It was, we saw what was going on. So much money within Sinopec, Everybody was dirty. It was, it, was, it, was, it was horrendous. So that's what C did. But in order to do that, he took power away from the state council, from the ministries who he was going after, and formed his own leadership groups under his direct control, these Ling Dao Xiaozhu, these leadership groups, which he officially headed and put his people in and actually took over governing power from the ministries so he had launched these, this anti-corruption campaign. And that's what he did. The problem is China's much cleaner now. but the power is still centralized. The key is to see, what does he do now? He's got all the power. Does he let it go? That's not human nature. Right. So it's an interesting time right now to see what she, she does. Um, First of all, I would like to thank you because your presentation was really very uh, admirable, actually. <laughs> One thing that uh, you didn't talk so much is uh, the United States, or better to say, the empire of America, the American empire, is based particularly on the control of the sea. You know that every route, maritime route, is controlled by the Americans. 
and they believe that China is very much aware of it. Mm -hmm. And all uh, the attitudes, uh, particularly in the last uh, few years, it was really to devote a huge amount of money on trying really to build up the sea Power. let's say power to be able i don't say to contrast the american empire but at least to start to feel at the same level when we are coming to this point i also believe that probably the conflict between the two one empire and the other they would like to become an empire and i like very much your uh, analogy with athens and sparta you know, is inevitable. You know, I believe that the biggest problem is really at all, not the biggest problem, the biggest play is going to be on the maritime, on the sea control. Because there is not only the military, but it's also the economical kind. The around the economical round today, they are controlled completely by the American Empire. Yeah. Everywhere, it doesn't matter if it's the China Sea, or it's the Atlantic, or the Pacific. Everything is controlled by them. Freedom of navigation. And I think that this is going to play a big, a big weight in the in the conflict or the confront or the possible confrontation between the existing empire and the coming one. Hmm. Thank you very much. Oh, well, I, 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 agree, I agree with you. I, I agree with you. The, the, the control of and ensuring freedom of navigation is solely the, and has been since World War II, America's role. And the world including China, coattails off of that. There would not be the free flow of goods, trade around the world without the United States ensuring freedom of navigation. Absolutely. And China benefits from it. Okay. Now, why, why South China Sea? Why is China now all of a sudden, hey, China has the biggest in terms of number of ships, the largest navy. Um, okay, two things. Oil and gas in, in the region, in disputed islands and whatnot. There's been massive discoveries. And, and you know who went out there? The political faction that had control of China's borders, right? And the Navy. And they went out, probably without getting permission from Hu Jintao or the rest of the military, to go out there, stake their claims, and, and do this, and cause a crisis. Now, China, overall, the government had to kind of back that. But unfortunately, I think that was probably sparked by, again, one of these silos of authority and, and uncoordinated with, with Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Now, but having said that, freedom of navigation enforced by the United States in the South China Seas to China, it says, well, we should be a part of that. We have claims of where our territory ought to be. Now, um, it's been working very well with the United States. But yes, it has. But China now thinks we, our historical position has been a, being dominant out in Asia, even in the seas, and that's why China has these exaggerated claims of what are its territories out there, because it used to have you know, pockets of settlements there. So China is just ex exerting what it feels it ought to have certain control over security in what is its swimming pool, right? Now, wait, wait, let me make one point. The United States controls this. United, China has the largest navy, but its ships are you know, three, five levels below what, what the United States is. China has one 
foreign military base, not in China. The United States has 800. Okay. So China is not going to be able to project power. It has one operating blue water aircraft carrier and two helo aircraft carriers. So it cannot really, it can't really uh, protect freedom of navigation. But what? So so maybe a more uh, um, I don't know. In, it's a, so there, there should be some sort of negotiation. I think, and I'm being naive because I'm not a diplomat about the hard politics of it all, and, and obviously there are security issues. Some sort of arrangement where, okay, we can do joint exercises. Okay, you can send your PT boats, your cruisers, and you can actually ride with us. Right? I mean, that would probably put that that issue to rest for 50 years, right? But, 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 and for a period of time, there were, you know, the US and China were actually doing joint military exercises. Well, why can't you do joint military freedom of navigation exercises? Well, right now, there's just no way, but. Yeah. Final question. Uh, I want to get back to your great thing about the middle income trap. And I've been doing business in China since the 90s as well, a lot of sign of back. So I got to see the power of when we can work together and find the middle ground. And I agree that the duopoly, if we work together, US and China, could truly impact a lot of the world's issues. The middle income trap, and I ask you to put on the US side of this challenge. And it's a hypothesis, maybe a provocation, is that since World War II, the U.S. has been the influencer of who gets out of the middle income trap, whether it be in Europe, the tiger countries, the ones you brought up, South Korea, Singapore, Japan, uh, uh, Taiwan, etc. I, the provocation is the U.S. has helped them raise up because they could figure out how to do it in a way that still benefited us. If we did it with China, with how big they are and how capable they are, it's not guaranteed that we can have that same degree of ongoing control and influence. So how does the US get past our fear and realize that we actually have to swallow a little bit of faith of if we're really gonna figure out how to help China get out of the middle income trap, we have to figure out that we won't necessarily be in control, but it is actually a better outcome for the world. Well, how, how does the United States do that? We have to make better decisions, have political vision and courage to get over. I, I, I think things are so perverted now. The, the misunderstandings, the relationship between the United States and China. And, and, and somehow we, we have to kind of untangle that and, and, and kind of be wide-eyed about what's going on. And then maybe the United States can, can propose ways to, again, collaborate with China, which benefits the United States, benefits China, uh, and, and other countries, uh, but but um, I, I think this takes a lot of detangling what's going on, and it, it's just a hairball right now. It's just if I gave this speech in Washington D.C. in front of the Washington D.C. crowd, mm. the security circles, the think tank circles, they would they would I would get a lot of very harsh, negative feedback. And they say, oh, this is your dog, oh, this crap about cognitive, com 
uh, cognitive empathy. But that's not, it's actually sympathy. I'd be attacked. Right? Mm -hmm. But that's, that's unfortunately where things are, especially in D.C., especially in D.C. So, uh, but, how, but, but how do we break out of this? I think we need to really get back to understanding, okay, we have to sit down with China and, 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 and work out protocols of over IP theft. Okay, protocols on industrial espionage, and, 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 and really tough ones, and, 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 and China will engage. But the United States, and, and the United States can force these things, but if it wants to, but, but there's no initiative to, to engage. I think the United States can engage in China in a, in a very, kind of in a controlled way. And I think America can, can kind of set the agenda, again, kind of because of what I've talked about, and certainly because of China's, America's position in the world. So it can set agendas of negotiation or discussions with China. And China will respond. I, you know, I, I think in, in the last meeting with Xi, what was there in, in Bali when they met, Xi Jinping gave a, gave a you know gave a speech. He said, about, "I'm paraphrasing, China and the United States. What are we doing? We have responsibility to everybody who is here to work together, to get along, to make the world better. That's our responsibility, and we are shirking our responsibility and duty. And that's what she said. said. And, uh, but that's true. But, but again, I think, and, and that's how I ended. There's no other country in the world. Well, first of all, it's only China and, and, and the United States. But actually, the United States, because it still is in a position of dominance and power, and, and, and because of historically, and that's why I was going through the historical relationship, of this admiration that still the Chinese and Chinese leaders feel towards the United States. But the United States says, okay, we're gonna talk about this, this, and this. And these are issues that China is really, you know, obviously affecting them, China will engage. Now, the, the negotiations can be very difficult. And, they can, and then you can have a lot of, I mean, in terms of, let's just say, uh, uh, industrial espionage. You can e even have uh, set up these uh, uh, technology centers where Chinese companies, Alibaba, Tencent, Huawei, turn over all their source codes. <laughs> And yet, U.S. companies do. And that's what the U.K. did with Huawei, just so they understand, and both sides understand, and this is run by the government, make sure that there's no back door and there's no leaking of information. Now, you can set up very, very effective enforcement and policing mechanisms. They're tough to negotiate. But you know, China and the United States have been through a lot of difficult negotiations, as I kind of talked about a little bit. But I think that needs to happen. But things are so politicized right now. You can't talk about collaboration. That's a four-letter word in China, about China. Uh, Kurt Campbell. Kurt Campbell is the... Is the coordinator for Indo-Pacific strategy and policy. So he actually sits on top of the NSC, State Department, and all the agencies, Kurt Campbell. But in Obama administration, actually, he was the one who drafted this pivot to, pivot to Asia. And you know, he's a very elegant, really nice guy, but he's got a certain view. And he said, informally, he said, win-win cooperation with China is bullshit. He said, what? So maybe he's changed. This was, this was earlier, but, but I, I, I don't understand. <laughs> but but that, that's Washington, D.C. right now. It's unfortunate. Well, thank you to Rose and Andy.